Yeah, so uh, thank you for inviting me. This has been really cool so far. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, as Pedro said, I'm going to be talking about making movies of black holes. So in the heart of um, our own Milky Way galaxy, there's this four million solar mass black hole called Sagittarius A star. And we've never seen a picture of it before, but we predict we've actually never seen a picture of any black hole before. But we expect that if we were to able to zoom in at radio wavelengths, that we would be see this ring of light caused by the gravitational lensing of hot plasma that is zipping around the black hole. And we call this, this ring of light the black hole shadow. And the black hole shadow tells us a lot about um, the black hole's event horizon and thus about Einstein's um, equations of general relativity. So Einstein's equations t predict what the size and shape of this ring would be. So taking a picture of it wouldn't only allow us to, you know, wouldn't only just be really spectacular, but it would also allow us to verify if these theories hold, in the, the, if this theory holds in the extreme conditions around a black hole. But you know, this black hole is really, really far away from us, and it's the event horizon is quite small. It's very compact, so um, so this ring is very, very small to us on the sky, and so taking a picture of it is really hard. So about the, the size of it is it's 50 micro arc seconds across for us on the sky, which is about the same size if you had an orange on the moon and you try to take a picture of it, or a, a, an atom at arm's length. It's about that size, very small. So that it, it's hard to take a picture of. But there's another reason it's quite hard, and that's due to the wavelength that we need to observe it at. So um, due to a number of factors, including where the um, spectrum peaks for the black hole around the event horizon, where there's also how, how we get past the interstellar medium um, that's between us and the black hole, and also where the shadow actually becomes visible, where all the stuff around the shadow becomes optically thin, and we can actually see that shadow. Due to the combination of these effects, the sweet spot is about one millimeter. And observing at one millimeter actually ends up to be quite difficult. But you know, if we just plug in the angular resolution, we need to see that 50 micro arc second ring. And um, the wavelength of one millimeter, you can easily calculate just due to diffraction how big our telescope needs to be in order to see something this, um, this small and at that wavelength. And it ends up being about the size of the Earth. And if we could build this Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out this distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black hole's event horizon. So, you know, obviously we can't build a telescope the size of the Earth, but by joining telescopes uh, located around the world, I've been w working as part of an international collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope that is building a computational telescope that's the size of the Earth and is the first one able to reco recover structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon. And so, joining telescopes in this manner is called very long baseline interferometry. And the Event Horizon Telescope recently has become operational, and we're actually analyzing the first results from it now that we hope, you know, hopefully we'll be able to present uh, uh, images to you guys soon, um, you know, if, if everything is successful. So it's a really exciting time for us being able to work with this data. But how do we actually make a picture from this computational telescope? So um, unlike with a camera in VLBI, um, we don't actually capture, capture the picture of the black hole in image space. We capture it in its frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole image's Fourier transform. Um, and if so if we had telescopes all around the world, everywhere on the globe, then we would measure all frequency components of the image, all spatial frequency components. But since we only have a few telescopes, we only sample a very small number of uh, of, of, of these spatial frequency measurements. And so it turns out that for every two measure, uh, telescopes, we sample one spatial frequency measurement that's related to the projected baseline between those telescopes. Um, so in order, so you know, telescopes that are close together are gonna have a small projected baseline, so we're gonna measure um, large spatial frequencies. To, so to get to the high spatial frequencies we need to measure that ti those tiny details of the black hole ring, we need to put our telescopes as far apart as possible. But you know, with the Event Horizon Telescope, we only have like six locations around the world that we're observing at. So that would only be six choose two, which is 15 measurements that we can observe, and that's an incredibly sparse number of measurements to work with. But, uh, uh, but as the Earth actually rotates, the projected baselines change. And so this amounts to carving out different elliptical patterns in the frequency plane uh, as, as the Earth rotates. And so we can also use that to our advantage. So at this point, you can kind of abstract away a lot of the astrophysics and just think of it as a computational imaging problem. 
we have these SMARS ends up being very noisy measurements, but our goal is to take those measurements and find the image that caused them. And okay, so by you know, um, observing the black hole as, uh, as the Earth is rotating, um, we get the sparse measurements. And if we were able to you know, observe all the possible frequency measurements, spatial frequency measurements, this would be trivial. We would just need to do, take the inverse Fourier transform in the case of no noise. But because it's sparse, there's an infinite number of possible images um, that, that could have caused this data. So how, how, do we, uh, how do we pick between them? Well, you might ask though, is this problem really all that unique? Uh, and in fact, you might know that um, the idea of using disjoint telescopes um, um, together to form one virtual telescope has actually, this idea has been around for a while, um, called interferometry, or you know, when they are far apart, this very long baseline interferometry. Um, and so for instance, the VLA, um, has been used in, in um, New Mexico, has been used to make many images also of our own galactic center. However, the wavelength and the distances between these um, telescopes is very different than what we're dealing with with the Event Horizon Telescope. So there, the data that we get from something like the VLA is much easier to work with at the expense of you're not even, you know, even close to an order of magnitude to what you need to see to get to that black hole on the horizon. And so I'll get to some of uh, the details later, but basically the algorithms that were developed to work on this kind of data really break down on data from the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, so wh what are some of these? I wanna give you a sense of what this, the, this traditional method is. So the traditional method used to image is called CLEAN. Um, it was developed in the 70s, and this is just the standard method that you know, this is pretty much it, uh, everybody uses for making I images in radio astronomy. And CLEAN first works by assuming that the measurements kind of aren't sparse, and it just puts a zero everywhere where you haven't seen any measurements, we haven't observed any measurements, and then it just takes the inverse Fourier transform of these, and so you get this kind of messy image, but it kind of looks something like the true image, and and then CLEAN works by basically trying to, to clean this up, and it does that by assuming that the underlying image is just made up of a bunch of point sources, and so it, 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 it iter iteratively deconvolves, adding a point source at different locations until you get a bunch of different point sources and then it blurs them together to make this kind of extended source. And so this method, you know, it, it, it's been used in, it's used in radio astronomy extensively and it works pretty well in the case that um, you're, you have a lot of telescopes operating at um, longer wavelengths that are, you know, the data is well behaved. But for the short wavelengths that the Event Horizon Telescope operates at, these methods really break down. Um, and one reason that they really break down is that we have to deal with a lot of different kinds of noise that, the, that these methods uh, th don't typically have to deal with. So at one millimeter wavelengths, the atmosphere is really, t t really bad. The coherence time of the atmosphere is really short, and so it's basically impossible to get a lot of cali uh, to calibrate the data or calibration is pretty poor at least. And so, but these clean methods really rely on this calibration. Um, so I'll get into some of the details of this noise in a little bit, but basically for this reason, the initial image that you would get from a clean, when you don't include all this calibration, is all completely scrambled, because we've actually lost a lot of our phase, all of our phase information, and a lot of our amplitude information due to not having calibration, and, um, and so cleaning up this scrambled image is really, really hard, if not impossible, for these methods to do. And so, um, for that reason, we've been developing new Bayesian-inspired methods that deal directly with understanding how this noise affects the system and try to incorporate that into the imaging process. So we don't have to first start with really nicely calibrated data, we just kind of all mix it in together. And, um, and so using um, these kind of methods, we've been able to reconstruct pictures um, from this very sparse, very noisy data. So here I'm showing a simulated uh, image reconstruction done um, when we assume that uh, we're pointing our telescopes towards a black hole, only five telescopes, and um, so we have the sparse data, and this is the image that we reconstruct when we assume all these different kinds of noise. Um, so I wanna emphasize here that these images and all the other images in this presentation are um, synthetic reconstructions. We, uh, 
We don't have data to show right now for, for the real data, but, um, but basically doing these kind of simulations with realistic data gives us a sense of what is possible to do with this kind of data. Um, but how did we get these kind of images? How did we, how did we uh, um, reconstruct without this calibration? Um, so basically, first I want to just explain to you some of the larger kinds of corrupting noise that we have to deal with. And they, most of these have to do with the atmosphere and the fact that it's very, um, the coherence time for the atmosphere is very short at one millimeter wavelengths, about one second um, of time, and that al doesn't allow us to have calibration. So basically the whole idea, um, the, r the whole reason VLBI is able to work in the first place is due to the fact that um, light that is coming from the black hole, it's going to travel to Earth and it's going to arrive at one of the telescopes slightly before the other one. And this time delay is the key factor for extracting that 2D spatial frequency measurement. But when you have a different, when you have telescopes all around the world, one in Hawaii, one in Spain, one in Chile, they all have different atmospheres above them, and so they all have an additional phase delay that is added to that signal, and uh, that is um, that delays that signal. And that phase delay actually appears in our frequency measurement, so our our uh, our complex uh, Fourier. Fourier component has an additional phase in it that's affected by the atmosphere. So that's kind of bad. But in addition to that, um, the varying atmosphere also attenuates the light that we're seeing differently, and that changes really fast too. So in addition we, to losing our phase, we also lose a lot of our amplitude information. So we have these additional gains at each site that vary very quickly, and um, not as quickly as the phase, but, um, but still very quickly. And so we also are modifying the amplitude. So basically this looks pretty bad. Our measurements are, are that are the, these complex measurements that we're supposed to be using to invert. Both have amplitude errors and phase errors, so <laughs> it, it looks pretty terrible at first. But if you but notice that if you have a third telescope, that um, that the, the measurements that you get by cross uh, taking the cross correlation. So remember, each measurement we have is from a pair of telescopes. So if you have a third telescope and you um, take the measurement with that one and you are going to share some of these air, um, these air terms. So the, for instance, G1 is the same, and phi1 is the same as when you had the measurement one and with telescopes one and two. So we can kind of use that to our advantage. And what we can do is, uh, is form what is called closure quantities that basically try to eliminate um, these calibration errors. So in, um, there's two different kinds of closure quantities we deal with. One is called closure phase, and one's called closure amplitude. And in closure phase, you basically add up the phases of the, of the complex visibilities, the complex measurements you get in a closed loop. And by adding them in a closed loop, you actually get these additional um, phase errors from the atmosphere to cancel out, and you get a term that is the phase only due to the sor intrinsic source and not at all due to uh, the atmosphere. And so this allows us to get around our phase. And closure, in closure amplitude, you, you um, take the visibility, uh, the measurements, and you uh, multiply them and divide them in a certain order, such that the additional gain errors actually also cancel out, and we're left with a term that is the same as if we had perfect gains. So these two um, uh, quantities, um, we didn't develop them. They were developed a long time ago, but they're typically used for calibration purposes. You know, before it's passed on to imaging, these kind of quantities are used to help us calibrate the data. Um, but, I, but since we have a really hard time calibrating, instead the idea is to incorporate these directly into the imaging. So, and, and that's kind of what we've done with these kind of Bayesian style yeah. methods. We, we assume ahead of time that our calibration is really bad, and let's constrain these closure <coughs> quantities. So for instance, here's an example um, showing when, okay, in both cases we've assumed the phase is uh, we we don't have any phase calibration, uh, but on the in the top uh, row, sorry, the middle row, I guess, um, we assume that we do have um, correct amplitudes, and on the bottom row we say, oh no, we don't know any calibration about the amplitudes, and only um, and pretend we didn't have any information about calibration of phases or amplitudes, and what image do we get? And so notice that as we add more and more gain error eventually our uh, methods break down when we um, constrain the amplitudes. But when we are constraining these closure quantities only on the bottom row, we can recover images even when our data is really poorly calibrated. 
And this has been really great because we can now have calibration-free imaging. You don't have to uh, have really great calibration at one millimeter ahead of time. And so developing methods like these has been really uh, a big step forward for our project and has allowed us to, um, to begin analyzing data of the two black holes that the Event Horizon Telescope is focused on at this one millimeter wavelength. And those two black holes are Sag A star, the one I talked about earlier in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, and also M87, which is at the center of a galaxy in the Virgo A um, constellation. So as I said, Sag A star is at the center of our galaxy. It's actually a fairly small black hole, only four uh, million solar masses, but it's also pretty close to us as far as supermassive black holes are. It's 26,000 light years away from us. And M87 is much, much bigger. It's 6 billion solar masses, but it's, uh, it is 54, around that range, 54 um, million light years away from us. So actually, um, because of this, these two black holes appear, the rings of them appear about the same size on the sky. And so the, those are the, both the two that are kind of, we believe uh, we can image with the Event Horizon Telescope. So although these, uh, the rings of these two black holes are uh, of similar size and, and therefore, you know, we hope a similar shape. Um, they are um, very different still. So because M87 is so big, its orbital period, the time it takes gas to rotate around the black hole, is, is 4 to 30 days. Whereas for Sag A star, because it's pretty small, it's 4 to 30 minutes. And so that means over the course of a night, we have a huge amount of evolution on the black hole. And so, uh, um, you know, observing the dynamics around Sag A star, so even though seeing just that ring would be enormous, it would be really big for us to see that ring, if we were able to also see the dynamics, we could learn a lot. And so the dynamics around Sag A star, if we were able to image it, could not only just tell us about black hole accretion um, and jet launching and a lot of different physics, but also one of the biggest reasons is that it would help us um, with our quest to um, verify, you know, Einstein's theory of general relativity through what is called um, the no-hair theorem. So um, you might wonder what the no-hair theorem is, and it basically postulates that the space-time surrounding a black hole is fully characterized by only three numbers, the mass of the black hole, the spin of the black hole, or its angular momentum, and its charge. Um, in effect, you know, it's called the no-hair theorem because there's no other hairs confusing uh, the process. There's nothing else that we have to worry about when kind of describing the space-time around a black hole. And so astrophysical black holes are expected to be neutral in charge, so we don't have to worry about charge. But, and, and mass has the biggest effect, but spin does have some effect. So here I'm showing three images with a constant mass, um, but different spins, and, and the shadows do change, although the size of the shadows only change about plus 4%. Um, 4%. So it's a small change in the size, but the, the shape around them does change. But why, you know, why is this important? Well, the no-hair theorem, theorem plays a big role in what is known as the infor information paradox. And this is where general relativity and quantum theory uh, really butt heads. So, um, uh, so uh, I just want to say this is not my specialty, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea of like, why this is important. So um, in the no-hair theorem, you know, we say, okay, anything we throw, well, okay, in the quantum theory, um, quantum theory has this um, conservation of information, which saying that in information cannot be tr ever truly lost. But in the black hole, we can throw, you know, tons of information at it. We can throw a dictionary of information, and it goes into the black hole. And that's okay, you know, uh, 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 but all that we can see, all the, the information we can observe is due to um, the black hole spin and mass. So we've lost all that information, and that's fine. Maybe it is in the black hole, and we just can't, re we can't uh, retrieve it. But the problem is uh, when Hawking ra radiation comes into the picture. And Hawking radiation basically says that black holes can just evaporate. And so that, that doesn't make any sense. Now all the information that was in the black hole you know, is lost. And, so and this means that information can disappear. And so um, both of these laws can't be true. And so if we were able to measure both the mass and the spin of the black hole, so the dynamics around it through the spin, we could begin to see you know, if there is a problem with the no-hair theorem, if it holds up. And ultimately, maybe we could try to even solve the information paradox. 
But as I showed you before, you know, measuring the spin of the black hole from just an image is just very difficult. It's hard to, there's an ambiguity. And also, uh, it's only a plus or minus 4% difference, which would be a tiny fraction of the, basically the point spread function that we have, um, that we're dealing with. But the black hole spin actually has a much bigger effect on the dynamics of the gas spinning around it. Um, so, you know, it affects how fast stuff is, is moving around. So if we were able to um, image the dynamics of a black hole of Sag star over the course of the night, we could have a better idea of this. But, you know, how does observing um, a quickly evolving black hole actually affect the measurements that we make? So remember, over the course of the night, we're sweeping out these different elliptical paths, and each of those red dots is going to be observing a different, basically, frame in our image. And so the data that we get from a quickly evolving black hole, as shown in blue, is very different from if it was static, as shown in magenta. And so um, if we tried to reconstruct a static image with all of this dynamic blue data, we end up getting a really, really bad reconstruction that isn't faithful at all to the original source, and it contains many artifacts. And if we were to only apply the same imaging methods that we developed to each individual frame of data, there's just not enough data to get a good image. Um, so it's basically we're reconstructing snapshots in this case, and we just get you know pretty bad reconstructions. <laughs> um, so instead, we've re recently been developing algorithms to jointly solve for a, a full video over the course of a night rather than just a single image. And the, the way it works is, you know, essentially, um, instead of just solving for one image, we say, okay, there's many images over the time, over the night that we're observing. And each image is only associated with a few of these independent measurements. So, you know, how do we go about um, uh, combining this information? Well, from frame to frame, um, the images aren't exactly the same, but, the, but they're, you know, fairly similar. And so there's only small changes between them. And so rather than independently reconstructing each frame that would result in these really bad images, instead we could kind of propagate that information across time. And this is done by first uh, modeling the data as a part of a graphical model with three components. So the first component says, you know, the, the each video frame should be consistent with the data taken at its time. The second is just that each video frame should, you know, be a sample from some sort of image prior look like what we expect images to look like, not look like random noise. And then also um, the fact that from frame to frame, um, they should look similar um, to each other. In some sense, you can define some transformation or just a pixel by pixel similarity. And so based upon this model, we can derive some sort of optimization algorithm that allows us to reconstruct a video from this very sparse data um, and change uh, the images that we recover from looking something like this to something more like this. So although this video is not as high quality as you would get from a single uh, reconstruction if, if you were looking at a static source, um, it's a lot better than if you assume that it's static and it's actually dynamic like this. Um, so here is uh, the reconstruction you would get uh, over time in that case, in the case that we're observing uh, just from these ground sites. And I want to hint at something from later on. So it's great that we can start to see this ring, which we couldn't get before, but you can't really see all the mat all the gas kind of flowing around it. So, you know, how well can we do at recovering that spin? Uh, but here I wanted just to show another example. Here's a, a orbiting hotspot. So this is a bright spot that or is orbiting the black hole. And um, this is what we would get if we assume it's a static image and once we allow it to um, you know, deal with uh, changes over time. And if we add just a couple more sites, we can start to get slightly better reconstructions where we kind of see those dynamics a little more clearly. But it's still not, not great. But, it, but I think it's a, a much better than we had before. But, you know, in addition, um, in, in this model, we could solve for some sort of transformation over time. So from frame to frame, we just don't assume that it's you know, um, some random perturbation of, of pixel intensity, but we could solve for that transformation, so that motion field that we would expect to see for different spins of a black hole, and maybe even try to recover uh, uh, this in that way. Um, and by doing this, we can try to recover these kind of motion fields simultaneously while reconstructing the videos. Um, so I, I've showed you um, how did we set up the model, but it actually also is pretty important how we optimize that model. Um, so I just kind of want to give you a quick idea how it is. 
it's not, it, it, the optimization algorithm that we do is very similar to a hidden um, uh, Markov model's forward backward algorithm, although it does have a few distinct details. So since our measurements, we have all that atmospheric noise, we're dealing with these nonlinear measurements. And also we attach an image prior to each image, uh, or like a term that's like an image prior, so that we can uh, better constrain our imaging. And so non nonetheless, just like in a um, hidden Markov model forward backward algorithm, you have this forward pass um, that solves for the best image um, using the data seen up to that time. And, um, and that propagates both the mean and the covariance we're working with um, in, in, well, we have different optimization methods, but this one that I'm showing here is, uh, has a Gaussian approximation. And that, and, um, as I'll show later, um, propagating that covariance ends up being quite important. So as you see here, the, the, um, the area that we have the most uncertainty in and that is propagated through this covariance actually tells us a lot about like, the information that we're missing so far in our data. Um, seen up to that point. But so, okay, so once we've made a forward pass, then we do a backward pass, combining the information to get that video. Uh, okay, and so as I mentioned, um, th that covariance ends up being really important because our data is so sparse. Um, and, and it helps it to tell us what parts of the image do we trust and which parts don't we trust. Um, and so, for instance, and, and here are some reconstructions, uh, on the middle is when we don't propagate that uncertainty, and on the right is when we do. Um, this is actually for a little bit cleaner data than <laughs> is realistic, but, um, but you can see when we don't propagate that uncertainty, we don't get that ring structure. But when we do, we get more of that ring structure. And this is more realistic data when we've had all those <laughs> miscalibration errors. And in that case, we really don't get any ring when we don't propagate that uncertainty. And we start to see that ring uh, when, when we um, incorporate uh, the uncertainty, but it's still not great. And you know, it, and it's, uh, and we really can't see the spin and all the matter kind of, of gas going around. And so um, uh, one reason though it's so bad, as you might guess, is just because how sparse the data is. So a natural question that you might ask is, you know, can we easily add other telescopes to the array? And the short answer is, well, n not really, or at least not really easily. Um, so most of the VLBI telescopes that are, are used operate at much longer wavelengths. Um, so for instance, the VLBA, which is across um, the United States, and there's some also additional sites here, um, those operate at a lowest, uh, at three millimeter wavelengths. And as I showed before, we, we really need that sweet spot of one millimeter. So here is some data that we, um, we recently published with three millimeter of Sagittarius star, and as we expected, um, well, although this tells us a lot of information and a lot about the jets of our black hole and or the lack thereof, um, we can't get down to that event horizon. So you can see on the bottom, these are the reconstructions we have at three millimeters of our black hole, and, and that scattering screen is really obscuring everything. And so most of the telescopes work, you know, at longer wavelengths. So although we can't easily add other telescopes, there's two options. One is we can build and equip new ground sites, and we're continuously doing this. So for instance, this past year, we added the Greenland Telescope um, to our array, but this takes time, and it's expensive. And, um, but, but, and one other reason it's kind of difficult is there are really only a limited number of sites around the world that are high enough elevation um, that could um, observe at the wavelengths we need. And also, of those sites, not many of them have really nice dishes that can observe at that uh, short wavelength. Um, and option two, you know, well maybe, maybe we want to go to space. Maybe, um, maybe um, we can build and launch low Earth orbiters instead. And so um, this might sound like a little bit of a crazy idea, but, but we are currently thinking about um, what options there are and if this could really help a lot. And, and it sounds, um, although expensive, promising. <laughs> so, um, so is this actually that crazy? Well, Space VLBI has actually been around for a while. Um, so back in um, 1986, it was first demonstrated on, the, on a satellite TRSS, TDRSS, sorry. And um, although this, this was satellite wasn't built for this purpose, they showed that they could actually get these fringes. They could make these measurements with um, combi um, connecting a space dish with a ground dish. And so that was uh, pretty big. And then in 1997, they developed a, a, a dish, a, a space dish for this purpose called VSOP. 
And, um, and then most recently, in 2011, Radio Astron, which is a Russian project, um, launched, and they've been observing um, uh, at much, very long baselines. So at 28 Earth diameters, it's, its orbit is, and so it goes out to nearly the, di um, to the moon's orbit, and so they get these really long baselines. But unfortunately, um, all of these are observing at much uh, larger wavelengths, longer wavelengths. So for instance, well, all the lowest one is Radio Astron, but it's only 1.3 centimeters, not millimeters. So again, we, we can't see um, into that, see that event horizon, the photon ring, uh, uh, with these space dishes already that have operated. And so although the angular resolution is really small, around seven or 10 micro arc seconds, just because of how long that baseline is, the wavelength isn't where we need it to be. And so instead, um, we've thought about um, adding uh, and been exploring adding space on uh, low Earth or orbiters. So these low or Earth orbiters, because they're in space, you don't have a problem observing through the atmosphere. Of course, there are a lot of other problems. But so we could observe at um, 1.3 millimeters or even go lower to 0.8 where we would, would be even less affected by things like scattering. Um, and, um, but instead of putting it really far out like the radio astron, we would want it to be more like one Earth diameter, but just so we're, that we're spil filling in that frequency space really quickly. So we, at a low Earth orbit, we'd have a period of something, we could do something like 90 minute orbit, and so these things would be moving around really quickly, and we could um, sample a lot of that frequency space. And if you had a, um, oh, and also you're obviously gonna add a lot more baseline. Um, and, and also we could add maybe you know, a, a cluster, a constellation of orbiters, or, or, or I guess a lot of them like diametrically opposed, where you know, they all rotate and add not only um, the baselines from those space dishes to the ground sites, but also space to space baselines that would be longer than the diameter of the Earth. Um, so it's a little hard maybe to see what the advantages until you look at the UV coverage and how quickly it, uh, it fills up. So here on the left, is showing the red dots are the current times UV coverage. You can see how slowly it fills up over time versus if you have even one orbiter, how fast, it, uh, how fast you fill up that space. Um, and so this would have a 90 minute period. You could get like enough to, to really make a pretty good image. And if you add four orbiters, you can see you just fill up that space really quickly. And no ground site would allow you to fill this up so quickly just because we are relying then on the Earth's rotation. And so here just shows, you know, in a 30 minute period, uh, segment, like how much um, of the UV space, we, uh, of, sorry, that frequency space we would be filling up. So here for the one, um, this is for 1.3 millimeters, um, you see on the ground uh, site, you, you kind of just have these sparse locations you, you'd see in within a 30 minute period. But even with one orbiter, you really fill it up quite quickly. And with four, you have an amazing coverage in 30 minutes. And, um, and also, you know, because we are in space, um, it's easier to, um, to get down to um, shorter wavelengths, which we can connect to ground sites, but it's much harder to find ground sites that do operate at the shorter wavelength. And so the, you, the coverage would look the same, be the same pattern, but we could, we could but basically they're scaled outward just, um, so we would be measuring higher spatial frequencies, smaller scale structure, it, it, with the same kind of pattern of how we've sampled the data. And so here's just a, a sample reconstruction using these kind of different three array configurations. So on the left is the truth video. Um, the second one is if you're just using the ground sites. And I think this is a, also, in, yeah, this is including some future sites that we are also um, hoping to add to the array in the next couple years. And then um, here you can see one orbiter and four orbiters. And so when you, on the ground, just the ground sites, you can get that ring, but it's very hard to see. Um, and, and for the four orbiters, you can even start, and, and for one orbiter too, although it's kind of hard to see in this, but you can kind of see it, like some, there's this gas that comes around and you can watch that move around. And, and so obviously, you know, we need to improve both our imaging algorithms too, but there's a lot of promise in, in you know, tracking that gas moving around the black hole and getting much better reconstructions. Here is for that um, orbiting hotspot, which is something we believe is, is going on around the black hole where you have this bright spot. And, and if we could track it and see where it is with respect to the, that, that event horizon, we could learn a lot. Um, so here you can see uh, with just the ground sites, it's really hard to figure out what's going on, but with four orbiters, we can start to track 
that motion better. So you may ask really how feasible is all of this? And that's a really good question. And so we're trying to get a handle of that ourselves we're, you know, in, in trying to prepare for what a proposal would be. And we've been talking and, and working with a lot of people at JPL and at NASA and at MIT's Lincoln Lab. And also, um, I want to call out Daniel Palumbo, who has been a really stellar, he's a first year graduate student at Harvard, and he's been really stellar at trying to um, understand all this stuff and understand our limitations. And basically, um, what our needs are is we, you know, we have, we um, are assuming we're, um, um, so Cygnus Star and M87 are in this one to two Jansky range, this is kind of the units uh, of, of what we observe at. And so we need our noise to be around less than 20 millijanskys, so our thermal noise that we would get on these baselines. So given this, we have a bunch of knobs that we can play with. You know, how, how do we change the different knobs on the dishes and on the receivers and, and different um, things that we, in our sensing system, so we can get down to this 20 millijansky limit? And so one thing, um, so three things that we um, do play with are the averaging time, the bandwidth, and the dish and receiver quality. So, um, Averaging time on ground sites is really dictated by how, fa how uh, coherent the atmosphere is. So how long can we average? And this ends up being you know, like about a second, very short. And on, in space, it's basically how fast are you sweeping out that coverage so that you don't have a full phase wrap in your uh, frequency measurements of the image. So basically, you're limited actually by the extent of the image. Um, but so if we fix those at kind of the upper limits that we can, that we can um, measure, um, conservatively, I guess, um, then we can deal with the bandwidth and also the, the dish and receiver quality. So, you know, bigger dish allows us to collect, have more collecting area um, or, or having a, a better dish efficiency um, or receiver temperature. This will, we can trade these off with bandwidth. And so we believe that the bandwidth that we are, um, are currently operating at in a four uh, meter dish, uh, which could fit inside a SpaceX Falcon 9, that we would be able to you know, uh, um, get these get detections to these space sites. So here is showing uh, the thermal noise that we would expect on the different baselines. Uh, I think uh, uh, so. Um, blue are really strong detections, less than five millijanskys in thermal noise, and then the um, reds are detections that would be below this twenty millijansky limit. So things that we expect that we would uh, we would be able to uh, to make these detections. And so, it, it, you know, it's looking promising, but we're trying to figure out um, what, the, uh, what the best, you know, knobs are. Um, and one thing is, you know, there are a lot of other things that we have to consider. For instance, we're recording really fast. Um, we, you know, get, we record about, I think with a 25% duty cycle, we would record about 200 terabytes a day on each site. So just getting that data down, storing it is a huge problem. And all the stuff we believe is, well, we know, I think, it's possible. It's just a matter of how costly is it. And, you know, and reducing our costs allows the mission, a mission to be more possible uh, or more likely. So how do we optimize all these knobs? Um, so, you know, maybe don't get perfect information, but get enough that we need so that, you know, we can actually have a mission. And, and this is something that we're working on now, this optimization problem. And another kind of fun optimization problem is how to optimize the orbits of these so that we're not just focused on one target, but focused on maybe a, a, cl a collection of targets um, that, that it would be interesting to observe. And so, you know, not just observing these, um, tech, these hardware needs, but also the orbits of these satellites is a really interesting problem that I'm excited about. And even potentially one thing we could do if we had space dishes is go out to higher um, orbits. So for instance, um, geosynchronous orbit, or, um, would allow us to um, see even s smaller shadow diameters because we'd be increasing that baseline length. And we could start to see black holes that we just miss with our Earth, base, uh, our Earth diameter baselines and be able to even see more than just those two black holes. So here is a simulation done by Vincent Fish and Kazu Akiyama of, of the black hole M104. Um, and that, you know, this is much smaller than our current resolution would be able to achieve, but something with a space baseline would, would be, you know, it would be doable. So that'd be pretty neat too. So um, these new imaging algorithms in conjunction with these do s new sensing strategies and, and maybe going out to space, hopefully will allow us to make these first images and videos of black holes and, and learn about the dynamics of what's going on and eventually even about 
um, general relativity and the uh, physics of our universe. And so with that, thank you. I'd like to also thank the Event Horizon Telescope and all the people that I work with there. Sure. Sure. So I'll say a couple things along that. So one is that we, if we knew, like we can have it. So there is like the motion is a little complicated because there's um, some instability in the gas and, and how it kind of uh, moves around. But we ex we know that what uh, how fast things are orbiting at different radii from the black hole, or we'd expect this based upon our current understanding of physics. And so we could try to impose that and see, oh, if we impose this certain uh, velocity at, at different radii, what is our best reconstruction? Of course, we don't want to get into the circular argument where we're using our theory to prove our th the theory. But For sure. So what we can do is look at these things, these closure phases. Remember, we don't have the absolute phase, but we have these closure phases and look for period periodicities in that. And so we do are working on that in that way too. Although, you know, it's hard to know uh, they're complicated systems and they're not just rotations of, of the same image uh, um, moving around. So it's a little hard in some cases to recover that periodicity, but that is definitely a non-imaging approach that we're doing to try to recover those. Um, also, another thing is um, this uh, gravity interferometer, this um, um, published results last year, I guess. And it was a really neat result where they were, um, um, they can't do imaging per se, but what they do is they um, can track these hot spots going around. And they actually made a detection in the center of our galaxy uh, at around Sag A star of some sort of hot spot that was rotating. And so they, it's unclear, you know, where exactly that hot spot is relative to the event horizon because you can't do the full imaging, but um, combining with maybe observing at the same time as gravity or other multi-wavelength data would allow us to maybe even get better estimation of those periodicities in addition to just uh, seeing them from the data, the raw data frequency. So yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that there is a lot. No, for sure. And I think that you, there is a lot of connection. There are differences, of course. Um, and that, for instance, the types of noise we experience are is a, a lot different. Um, uh, I would I would say <laughs> worse, but maybe there's wor things that are worse in, in the data that they measure. But this makes it so that maybe you know when we're optimizing these different parameters, we have to take that kind of noise into account too. So you know a, a typical way of how you would do a randomization, a random pattern in MRI might not be the ideal pattern for something that we're dealing with. So as just an example, uh, remember I said that we have really bad amplitude calibration sometimes. So um, one way that we've uh, kind of um, realized, or I realized it after working with imaging, is, th is th um, so remember if you have, you, you're measuring a spatial frequency that's related to that baseline. So you would think, okay, why would you ever put two telescopes at the exact same location? You're gonna just measure the exact same spatial frequency. But it turns out because of the noise that we're dealing with, actually having redundant sites is really important and we can gain a lot um, by using those closure quantities in, in our imaging. And so something that is, in, um, and it's a little bit non-intuitive, especially if you don't think about the noise in it. So I think, yes, there's a lot of similarities and we should you know, draw from each other, but also you have to think about the, the, speci uh, 
what is special about this problem and how does that change how you would optimize and, 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 and sense the data too. So I think, yeah. Yeah. So I want to preface that I'm not a physicist myself, so <laughs> I don't want to say too much. Um, I work with a lot of astrophysicists. Um, yes, there are other modified theories of gravity that we do consider, um, and also cr other things like boson stars and stuff. Um, uh, but I think, um, you know, a and at the resolutions that we're using now, it's hard to discount, you know, say, oh, no, the no how theorem is correct. Uh, but, but, you know, just seeing a shadow would be a big deal. And then hopefully we could add more sensors, do, do this uh, other kinds of ways to, to probe this space time that hopefully would allow us to, to, um, to um, you know, fig to, to rule ones out. But I don't think that um, we can't, I think we can't, especially with the measurements, like at the resolution we have now, just say, oh, the no hair theorem is correct. I think it's a step towards that direction. Yeah, so I would say that first there are different reasons people like clean. I think some people like it because, I mean, it just uses a Fourier transform, so it's fast, <laughs> right? But also, it, people understand it. People have used it. So one thing that I got, you know, we've gotten a lot. It, you have to, especially when you're introducing new methods, you have to do it slowly, <laughs> right? But is that, oh, we, it, it's um, clean is good because we understand where it's bad. You know, that's a, kind of the a thing a lot of people say. Um, but I think that especially for, so there's a lot of advantages. There are advantages to using clean because people understand it, people use it. But, um, but obviously the methods we have have a lot of advantages too. And, that, uh, and it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a bit of a give and take to, to find that sweet spot where people adapt your algorithm, uh, use your uh, algorithms, but that you, can, you are mo moving it forward. Um, so for the data that we have though, we ha uh, a lot of times, like for instance, ALMA, which is that um, the radio telescope in Chile has, I think, 60 um, dishes that it observes with. So it has a huge number of measurements that it makes, that it takes. And so um, there, yeah, it, although we have we have made images with clean, I'm sorry, with um, ALMA data. I don't have it here in this presentation. It is very slow, right? But because we only have, uh, you know, s s six sites of, of telescopes, we have very sparse data, and therefore, actually, it's you know, we make images um, in the less than a minute it takes. So it's not a really an issue for that kind of sparse data. Um, yeah. And, and clean does have ways of getting around this calibration issue. They do something called self-calibration, where they assume it's like a Gaussian point source, and then they say, oh, what would the phases be or the amplitudes be to best match an, a Gaussian point source? But this has problems when you, do, when, you're very di when you have an extended source that, you know, looks very different from a point source. But um, and a, a lot of the way they get around it is, is by a lot of user intervention. So it's not an automatic algorithm, really. Um, you put, you draw down clean box, what are called clean boxes, which are areas that you basically can fill in the flux from. So it's, it's very much a user-dependent method where we've been trying to go to automatic methods. Yeah, so it's, um, so the, the black hole in M87 is, uh, I don't know if it's not spinning as fast, but because it's so much larger, the mass doesn't go move around it as fast. So it's on the time scale of four to 30 days versus four to 30 minutes. And the, I, there, you know, that's, that's great because um, um, observing M87, if we were able to see it, 
um, would allow us to basically make an assumption that the image is static over the course of a day. And so we wouldn't have to take into account all this time variability. And, and that would hopefully allow us to get a picture of the shadow more easily. But you know, we <laughs> proposing for time on these telescopes is very hard and we don't have, you know, we can't observe continuously for 30 days. You know, we have uh, just a few nights of data we can uh, propose for it. And even um, th then, you know, we, ob we observe one time a day for, uh, one time a year for like five days. And so if you wanna see, um, this uh, uh, rotation, you probably, and, and you want to see how things are evolving, looking at Sij star in addition to M87, it kind of tells you a different piece of the story. And so that's why it's great that we have both of these, you know, that are, are um, hopefully within reach, but have very different properties. And also, I want to say M87 has a very unknown mass right now. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's unknown if it's three billion solar masses or six billion solar masses, whereas Sag star, we have a much better idea of it's four million solar masses because we actually have see the orbits of stars around it. So we have better prior constraints on what the mass should be. And so there's the less of an ambiguity problem as well. Yep. So the satellite stuff is a little far off. We're just starting to, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we collected data um, a, a while, uh, like a year or two ago, and it took, it's taken, because this is the first time that we've collected data from this telescope, it takes time to, first, like, since we collected the South Pole, it took half a year to even get the data. They have to, like, wait till it's the su summertime there to even ship it, because it's too much, we, we, we um, get petabytes of data that is then reduced down in the end to basically megabytes. So we go from petabytes to megabytes that we are using for the imaging. Um, but so this process of um, getting the data, because it's been our first time, has we, we're, we're being very careful <laughs> about every step. But then hopefully um, this year um, we're releasing results. So uh, we're, we're, it's an exciting time for us now. Um, yeah, so you're, you're saying like what like tool? Yeah, so we, um, I mean on the surface, like if you don't assume any noise, we basically have sparse spatial frequency measurements similar to what you have in like MRI or CT, uh, uh, or well I guess more similar to MRI, I guess, but um, in that case, but our, the noise, but where it kind of gets exciting is the fact that we can't uh, sample anywhere we want. We're kind of restricted by where we have telescopes on the Earth, and, and those measurements are there, therefore very correlated, and also the types of noise we experience. So we lose you know, our phase information, our amplitude information. If you lose both phase and amplitude, you would think you have nothing, but we do have ways of kind of recovering. We don't have absolute phase or amplitude, but we do have ways of recovering this. So we basically just you know, we solve optimization problems where we constrain these really noisy spatial frequencies in addition to some information like image incorporating other things like image priors that try to impose some smoothness or compactness or positivity is a big one. You know, light's not negative. And that's, so, so that's something we can really believe uh, to impose. And so um, we're basically you know, solving these Bayesian inspired, inspired methods, optimization methods. Yeah, so, oh, okay, so, yeah, so the whole idea of priors and what priors to use is a whole different topic that I didn't even cover in this presentation. I mean, the, uh, it's, it's a really interesting problem of how do you impose a prior on something that you don't know what it looks like, right? And, and how do you do it in a way that you're not biasing your results to get you back an image of what you expect to see? And so um, this in itself is a really um, interesting problem. Um, the results that I showed here or at least in the latter half um, that were on the um, time variable stuff, we because the optimization problem is um, really messy, or because the because we have very sparse data and everything, we um, I was only imposing um, Gaussian priors in that uh, each image 
It was a sample from a multivariate Gaussian that had some sort of distribution on the spatial frequencies. Um, so, you know, I don't have anything now, but you, if you sample from it, you just get like blobby kind of structure. And then um, also that each from frame to frame, each pixel in that frame is similar to its pixel in a neighboring frame by, you know, some Gaussian constraint too. Um, and, and, and so that allows us uh, to solve for something that usually a Gaussian prior is very, it results in really messy looking images, but it gets you, you know, a good part of the way there, I guess. But if you, we also um, work on, you know, constraining other kinds of priors, you know, the typical ones like sparsity priors and um, compactness priors and stuff. Uh, and one that um, I also explored um, is um, data-driven priors. So, like, let's say you took, you have a co big collection of images, like natural images, like you'd have on your phone, and you, um, and you learn the statistics of the correlations between pixels there and impose that on your reconstructions and see how that image changes based upon if you have a different kind of images, like all images of cats or images of black holes, you know, uh, synthetic images. And how does the imposing these different kind of statistics change the images? And we find that if you uh, restrict yourself to a very local neighborhood, you know, like a patch of pixels, like eight by eight pixels or five by five pixels for a 100 by 100 image, um, we can actually, it, it doesn't really matter that much which, which um, image priors we use. Um, if, if you constrain large areas and you look, care too much about those correlations, it does matter. But this is really nice that um, we have found that it really doesn't matter too much what image priors we're using, um, and it's not biasing our results that much, at least. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to show that, you know, oh, that our priors aren't affecting the results that we get too much. But that's a whole other, whole other bag of worms. <laughs> Sure. So uh, there's two. Well, I, I think I hinted at it, but I didn't go into it. Um, that in our model, we allowed you to have this transformation from time to time. And so you, if you say there's no transformation from time to time, what our optimization is is just like looking at the pixel, you know, 510 in your image and comparing it to 510 in its next door, its, its adjacent images, and making sure that those are similar. When you allow it to solve for also a transformation simultaneously, then you're saying, you're basically allowing some sort of flow field. And you say, okay, this image at 10, 5, 10, actually under this flow field that I've solved for simultaneously, it moves to pixel um, 3, 7, and I compare those images. Um, so um, there's basically simul one way that we've been working on it is simultaneously, you know, solving for this transformation at the same time as saying, oh, those that that transformation should have very similar pixels in those in its uh, in its transformed <laughs> image uh, location. So I guess that is a way, and and you could have you know you could have very simple transformations that are easy to compute derivatives of and stuff like affine um, transformations, or we could have more complicated ones like the ones that we believe you know uh, to be the velocity at different radii from a central position. So um, that's something that we should ex we need to explore more, though. We've only done simple things so far. Yeah. This, uh, I mean, the measures are great, uh, but it's it's the goal is to measure something specific about the uh, the performance or the property of the black hole. Yeah. Is there a, and is there a more direct way to measure that? So rather than going to the the image and then going from that to the central or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, so this is what, uh, um, let me go back to this part. Um, so essentially the way we had originally posed the problem in this paper um, was that we do want to recover this motion transformation field. And that motion transformation field could be directly related to the spin. You know, you could sol be solving for a parameter that basically, a parameterization of the spin and how it changes, or an orientation also. Um, but, um, the way that it actually ends up solving it. So here we were solving for the um, transformation. And the goal was actually solve for this transformation. But the way it, uh, it dropped, or that we optimized it, is through an expectation maximization algorithm. 
where the parameters that we're, they're trying to solve for is the parameters of that transformation and therefore the spin directly um, in, in the case that you use a certain um, transformation space. But actually in doing that, we're solving for the expected video. So we kind of recover the video for free in that case. But maybe you could also um, come up with new methods that don't require you to recover the video and just get you at that, trans uh, at that spin. For instance, looking at just the, um, uh, the closure quantities and, and periodicities in it, and this is um, under other ideas. Or just having maybe, you know, one reason I've a little bit stayed away from just pure black box machine learning algorithms is that we don't have a ton of training data, especially with different alternate theories. <laughs> um, and so, um, and you don't want to be too biased or, or by, by your training data, especially since it's all synthetic data. But this is, um, uh, you know, another thing. You could just train some sort of um, machine learning um, framework on, on the data, the raw data itself. 